life, you take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. We're in a brief study here of the life of Samuel as, as we deal with the subject of how God makes men and women. And I believe that God does make men and women, but he begins with boys and girls. And we've chosen the life of Samuel as a boy to watch how the Lord prepared him and made him into a great man. Really a man that was used as a pivotal person for an entire nation. And may God reveal those things to you as we look at his word together. We're in 1 Samuel chapter three and we'll begin with verse 19 in just a moment. We want you to know that the entire Bible is God's revelation of himself. God reveals himself through his word. Samuel knew the word of God, grew up with the word of God, preached and taught the word of God. As a matter of fact, he had a place where he traveled in a triangular area as a circuit judge declaring God's word and solving problems in the name of the Lord. The Bible tells us a portion of this story in 1 Samuel chapter three, beginning with verse 19. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of God. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark this expression, if you would, please. It's found in this 21st verse. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel. I want you to hold your place there and turn with me to the seventh chapter of this book. And the word of God gives us a summary in sort of Samuel's life and says in Samuel, verse 15, and Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and judged Israel in all those places. And his return, return was to Ramah, for there was his home, and there he judged Israel and there he built an altar unto the Lord. God raised up a mighty man. We've learned that his mother Hannah had prayed for a child and a man child so she could give him to God. When they went to worship, they went to worship at a place called Shiloh. At that moment in the history of God's people, that was the capital, that was the center of all that happened. The tabernacle tent was pitched there in Shiloh. The high priest made his offerings there in Shiloh. When people went to worship on special days, it was to Shiloh. When Samuel was weaned, his mother and father took him to Shiloh to live and to grow up in the place of God, around the man of God, learning the things of God. And the Bible here, if you're back in chapter three, tells us in verse seven, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. But then we read in the last verse in this chapter, the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of God. I have a very simple question for you. Has God revealed himself to you? Has God revealed himself to you? If the Lord has revealed himself to you and you've seen him for who he is, your life will never be the same. I want you to hold your place here just a moment. We're gonna to return to this chapter, but I want you to come to the New Testament with me, please. The Bible says that God does reveal himself to us. In Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus was in the coast of Caesarea Philippi, the word of God says in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus 
came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I the son of man am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now they were all wrong. This is what revelation they were saying they had of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what they thought was being revealed to them. But the Bible goes on to say, In verse 15, he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Notice carefully, Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. May I just pause and say, how does he know that? Others thought he was only John the Baptist or Elias or Jeremiah or some prophet. But how does this man know that he's the Christ, the son of the living God? And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father which is in heaven. I want you to mark, if you haven't marked already, that word revealed, revealed. One of our favorite Bible teachers for so many years was a man by the name of Dr. Frank Sells. He came here and taught the Bible. We just shut everything down and listened to him. He was nearly 90, and that gives us all a lot of hope, doesn't it? And we'd put a desk up here and pull a chair up and let him sit at the desk, and we'd just all sit out there and let him teach. And one day in his teaching, he said, salvation, salvation, is as much a revelation as it is a decision. Now, when he'd say things like that, he was purposeful in saying things like that because he wanted you to think about what he said. I remember one time he talked about the high priest going, going in to make the sacrifice behind the veil, putting blood on the mercy seat. And he said, what does the priest say when he goes in and sprinkles blood on the mercy seat in the Old Testament sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. And then he said, what does he say? <laughs> and all of us, you know, were trying to figure out, well, I think I know a little bit about the Bible. Let me think, what does he say? And he left it just long enough till we were all just speechless and he said, he says nothing. The blood speaks. Amen. <laughs> and I said that day when he, he said, salvation, your salvation, my salvation is as much a revelation, a revelation as it is a decision. Many people have popularized the idea that we make a decision for Christ. Uh, they expand on that and say we ask God to forgive our sin and by faith we trust the Lord Jesus as our personal Savior. And we explain salvation that way. We put a lot of emphasis on the time and place when we came to know the Lord. But Dr. Sells made us think that day about something that's biblically correct. Salvation is also God revealing himself to us. God reveals himself to us as the only savior. We're lost in our sin, separated from God, hell bound, kidnapped by the devil. He's running off to hell with us and there's nothing we can do about it. And we sense the guilt of our sin, the fact that we're lost, hell deserving and hell bound. And then God reveals himself to us as the only savior. So as Jesus said to Simon Peter, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which art in heaven. I believe in every person's salvation, God reveals himself as the Savior. Now, if that makes you doubt, don't let it make you doubt. Let the Holy Spirit work in your heart. If you're really not a Christian, you need to be born again. I've dealt with lots of people who don't know the day that they were saved. 
How many of you know someone like that? They really believe they're saved, but they couldn't take you to the time and place. They really have the evidence in their life that God lives in them, and they have these witnesses God tells us about, especially in the book of 1 John, the witness of his Holy Spirit, the love of the brethren, and so on. I've written a book about it. I hope you'll read it if you're interested. But they don't know the day that they're saved, but they know they're saved. The famous Bible teacher, F.B. Meyer, never knew the day he was saved. And he grew up troubled by that until he heard Charles Spurgeon say, you can be alive and not know your birth date. Speaking about salvation. Now I do know that people took me down a hallway in a church, set me across from a pastor's desk, opened the word of God and spoke to me about Jesus Christ and who he is. And I did pray and ask God to forgive my sin and invited Christ into my life as my savior. And I believe that God revealed to me that Jesus Christ is the only Savior and he revealed himself to me. I never preach to create doubts. I want to give you assurance. People who play with people that way, try to get them to doubt, to get them to make another profession of faith, I, I, don't, I don't want them to be the pastor of my family. I want to bring you to solid answers from the word of God. But I want to tell you something about Samuel I hope that will shock you because here's a, a baby boy that grew up to be one of the greatest men the world has ever known. He was used of God to turn an entire nation back to the Lord and to teach them the word of God. Now, how did that happen? How did he become such a mighty man? How did Samuel become such a mighty man? By the way, if you'd picked a time, an era, in Bible history that you would not have wanted to raise children in, it would have been his time. It was in the days of the judges when every man did what's right in his own eyes. I mean, everybody thought they got it and it was their way or no way. And it's, the Bible says, every man did what was right in his own eyes. It was anarchy everywhere. And this is what we're living in today. Uh, don't be surprised when your children tell you someday, I'm not sure I believe what you believe. Don't be shocked when somebody who's been in church most of their life comes up to you and says, I, I just need to be, be, be open with you. I, I don't believe all this stuff in our church. You know why? Because when Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Everyone has to come to it for themselves. Oh, it's the truth. I want to ask some of these, some of these people who've heard from God, from God since I have and want to tell me about it. They know more than I know about it. I want to tell some of them, what more would you expect me to do? There are, there are irreducible truths. Now get this, irreducible truths. You can't reduce it anymore. You can't take any more away from it. There are irreducible truths that we believe that live and abide forever. And that's what we preach and teach here. You may not agree with some of the trimmings, but you can't be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and other irreducible truths. So men are constantly, and women constantly, trying to design a faith that pleases them. You know what their problem is? They've never had God reveal himself to them. The Bible says the Lord revealed himself to Samuel. When God revealed himself to Samuel, what do you think Samuel saw the Lord to be? Let me give you a few verses to write down before we come back to the book of 1 Samuel. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. God is holy. And holiness, by the way, just as an application, is holiness and holy living is the answer to all your fussing and complaining about standards. 
There is one standard singular. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, be like him. Speak like him, talk like him, dress like him, walk like him, love like him. Be holy, holy, for I am holy, holy. The next time some, somebody wants to talk to you about what they don't like about what we call or you might call Christian standards, which vary from place to place, change the subject immediately and say, let's talk about the holiness of God, the holiness of God and the expectation God has for his people to be holy. Look in the book of Hebrews, would you please? In Hebrews, we close the 12th chapter of Hebrews with these words in verses 28 and 29. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. Now, if we're gonna serve God acceptably, I want you to look in the end of verse 28 about how we do it because he is who he is with reverence and godly fear. When God reveals himself to us, we come before him with reverence, which literally means with a bowed head, acknowledging that he is God and with godly fear. Why? Verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. I don't like to hear people joke about God, tell jokes about God and how he is and just sort of belittle it, you know, like he's a man like other men. No, no. No. He is holy. He's a consuming fire. We have to fear him. We have to come before him with reverence. There are many sincere people who believe in the God of the Bible who will not speak his name. They have such reverence for him. They will not speak his name. We live in a generation that's made God something flippant. And for those people, their God is not the God of the Bible. So I ask again, has God revealed himself to you? Has God revealed himself to me? Let's look back in our Old Testament passage. The Bible says in verse one of Psalm 90, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Has God revealed himself to you to be from everlasting to everlasting? Notice not only the Bible says in this chapter three of 1 Samuel that Samuel grew, that his words were spoken and heard and that God appeared to him again in Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh and look how he revealed himself by the word of God, by the word of God. I want you to write some things down because there is a, a divine weaver working in Samuel's life and working in your life. If we, if we listed, if we took the time to list the circumstantial things in Samuel's day, we would not ever list them as our thinking goes for circumstances that would build the kind of man that he became. And I want you to know that your circumstances, God's aware of. My circumstances, God's aware of. My ancestors, God's aware of. My parents, God's aware of. The man and the woman into whose home I was born, God is aware of. My education, God's aware of. Now listen to me. The teachers I had. I had one teacher in the first grade and another teacher in the first grade because I moved and I was only in the first grade for six weeks. And I remember Mrs. Williams, Mrs. Brown, 
but God was aware of them. They made a tremendous impression upon me. I can recall teachers in my education as a child that I thought were incompetent. Now, I was the one that was incompetent, but I thought they were incompetent. And I tried to convince my mother some of them were incompetent. And maybe there was some incompetency in them, but God knew I needed it because God is weaving my life and he knew all about them. Everything about my trials, God knows. How can God even make a statement like this? How can anyone make a statement like this? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. When we're outraged when some particular thing comes to one of ours that we love, we just are outraged, but yet God knows that's an element, an ingredient that they need in this master weaving that he's doing for their lives. I could say so much about that, but I'm just trying to get all of us, including me, to say thank you, Lord, for taking that kind of care and attention in my life and putting it all together. The Bible even says that all things are for our sakes. <laughs> How do you think that helps me deal with some of the things I never wanted to happen to me physically? I thought I would be the only pastor in the world that was like a decathlon athlete. When we played anything, I wanted to play. I wanted to jump into things. I was quarterback for both teams, you know. It was, just, it was just that way. But the Lord's taught me some other things, that he adds other ingredients. And may God help us here with these things. And I want to show you, if you look carefully at the life of Samuel, you're going to see things you would not have put into his life. But God did. Now before you think I'm wrong about this, I want to make this statement and I want you to write it down. Religious hypocrisy is the worst kind of hypocrisy. Insincerity among Christian leaders is the worst possible kind of insincerity. But watch. Here we go. Mother brings little baby Samuel He's weaned now. I'm going to leave him with Eli, the high priest. He was a fat, lazy bum. He finally fell off backwards and broke his neck. You going to give your boy to him? She brought him to Shiloh, to the tabernacle, to be raised around the man of God. She brought him to Shiloh and the man of God had sons and they brought prostitution into the worship. You gonna put your boy around that? Well, not deliberately. But that's what the Bible says went on. He lived in a day when people doing what's right in their own eyes and right on the edge as a, as a child when the ark of the tabernacle, the most sacred thing these Jews had with the Ten Commandments in it was going to be taken by the Philistines. He, he was going to go to live in a a village place north of Jerusalem called Shiloh that would be destroyed by the Philistine army. All they'd have left is ruins. And I want to ask you a question. Does God know what he's doing with this child? And the little petty things that you and I want to complain about and I'm putting myself in this, reveals that we have not seen the revelation of God that we should have seen, that know that he is an all-wise God and that we are the apple of his eye and he cares for us beyond anything we'll ever be able to describe. 
and all things are for our sakes. I'm telling you, there's a lot to learn and we don't learn it from the study of men or the watching of teachers. We learn it from God revealing himself to us. After all these years as a minister of the gospel, more than half a century, I can say that my greatest failure is that I do not know the Lord like I need to know the Lord. And the more I know and understand the Lord, the clearer everything else becomes. There's a second thing I want you to write down as we look at the life of Samuel, and that is that God prepares a person for his or her moment. God prepares. He's working. He's working. Now, the Lord knew I was going to be a pastor before I was ever a pastor. He allowed me to be the oldest of four children with a very needy mother, having to be responsible to look after three siblings, to care for what happened in the home, to protect before I really should have been responsible for protecting. I'm just saying God prepared me all of my life to do what I'm doing. And God is preparing you right now, this moment. He's preparing you to do what he has for you to do. And your moment will come. When it comes, you seize it. You'll see that God has revealed himself and you'll see that God has prepared you for that for that moment. When God spoke to Samuel, I want you to look at this passage of scripture in verse 10 in this chapter. God said, and the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. Then he repeats his name, Samuel, Samuel. This is the word of God. Why does it not just say Samuel? Why does it say Samuel, Samuel, for emphasis, to call our attention, to bring our attention to this. And this is a delicate thing, but I'm going to attempt to talk about it. You pray for me. Samuel at this point knew all about God and the things of God and the service of God. He knew what, he knew what things belonged in the temple, how they should be appointed. He knew what should be done with everything in the temple and how it should be done. He knew how to serve in the temple and who to serve in the temple. He was tremendously involved and obedient to all the service. He knew the voice of service, but he did not know the voice of God. And you're going to find out there are going to be young people who grew up in your home who know how to do things but don't know the voice of God. They know the voice of the church, the sound of a bell, the rules for a school, the way it's done around the church. They know all the voice of service but they don't know the voice of God. They just don't know. Sam was awakened and he ran to Eli. God was speaking. Sam was awakened a second time, he ran to Eli. But God was speaking. Why does God put this in the Bible? He was awakened a third time, ran to Eli. But it wasn't Eli that was speaking. I want to try to show you something here. In verse 1 of chapter 3, the Bible says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. Now, he was trained to be an obedient boy. He was a pleasure to have around. He did what he was told. He made other people happy by watching his obedience. But Samuel needed to know God 
for himself. And look at how the Bible puts it. The Bible tells us that Samuel, verse 7, did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of God yet revealed unto him. And the Lord tells us that Samuel's growing and developing, verse 19. And so now God comes again in verse 21. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. Why? For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel. He wanted Samuel to know him. Samuel must know him. And some of you have been the best boys and the best girls, and I'm thankful to God for you, the most obedient kids. You don't come across as a rebel. But your big problem is, child, you don't know the Lord. You don't know the holy God of the Bible, the God who knows all things, the one who cares more about your life and the plans for your life than anybody else will ever care. You don't know the Lord, the one who gave his only begotten son for you. It's a fact. It's a church fact. But it's not real to you. If a man is going to become the man of God and a woman, the woman of God, that can hear the voice of God, God must reveal himself to that man and to that woman. And if you want to be content with just going through the religious duties, playing the part, finding the stage and walking on it, getting in the light sometimes and doing your thing, and pass through your time that's expected. And then someday say, I don't, I don't go for this stuff. It's because you never knew the Lord. You never knew him. Because if you knew him, you'd know he loves you. That Christ died for you. That he's holy that he's from everlasting to everlasting. He knows all things about your life. He knows what is best for you, but he won't make you do it. And you know his way should be your way, but it's not. Now, God had such a special place for Samuel to lead a nation, for schools of prophets to bring the word of God back to a nation the right way back to his people. God had such a special purpose for Samuel. Samuel had to learn the difference between knowing the voice of service and the voice of God. We'll come to it later, but when Samuel made a journey to Bethlehem to find a king, the sons of Jesse were brought before him. If you'd looked at the oldest, he would look kingly, princely, capable, able, all the qualifications. But listen, the man of God, Samuel, who came to anoint him, knew how to discern the voice of God. And he said, no, that's not the one. The second son, no, that's not the one. He didn't just know that a king was supposed to be anointed and he knew how to hear God's voice. And right down the line, it seemed all of them were there. No, not him, not him, not him. God hasn't spoken, that's not him. And is there any other? And they said almost with an excuse, the youngest. He said, go fetch him. And breathlessly, David came running back from the sheepfold to his father's house. And God said, the same voice that Samuel learned to hear when God revealed himself, the voice of God was heard. And he said, this is the man. This is the man. Wouldn't you like to be a person who could discern between the voice of just service and the voice of God? 
I've been to this thing so many times trying to lead this church and what do we do next? What do we build? What do we get? How do we handle this? God, show us. Well, this is the way it's normally done and sometimes that's all we have and we do it. But it's an amazing thing when God speaks and the Lord, how does he speak? Not in an audible voice, but he impresses your soul and you know this is God's voice and the Lord guides. We need not just kids to grow up and mature. The Bible says Samuel did that. Not just to recognize physically they're no longer children, but this world desperately needs some boys and girls to grow up who truly know the voice of God because God's revealed himself to them. I'm praying for every one of you to be that. Let's pray, maybe.